but my name is Dr. Jacqueline Doherty, and uh, I direct the Western Center for Social Impact and Innovation. Um, Tracy, Matt Parker, and I are co-teaching one of the courses offered in the Western Program for Individualized Studies, um, which is our service learning course, and that is where the idea for this panel first germinated, um, because a lot of what we do in that course is think about you know, what are, what are ways that are purpose-driven that we can interact in the community and use the skills that we've gained at the university for that purpose? Uh, and through the course of our work together, uh, Tracy and I have thought a lot about where does this kind of good work happen? And, and by good work, I mean work that is mission-driven, that is purpose-driven, and that is aimed at social change. Um, so, Often we only associate that work in the United States and abroad with nonprofit organizations and non-governmental organizations. And so I'm really delighted tonight to have the opportunity to speak with the panelists who are joining us um, from sectors that we often don't talk about in terms of good work. Um, the first sector that we'll be thinking about are, uh, is the corporate sector and the for-profit sector and thinking specifically about the um, the impact of B Corps uh, and other ways that uh, social impact can be done uh, and can be tied to profit. And then we'll also be uh, looking at the governmental sector, which too often gets a bad rap uh, in terms of being able to make real social change. But I think that our panelist um, has a lot of experience in doing this in uh, one of the local communities in Southwestern Ohio. So with that, I will pass it on to Tracy and the panelists. Oh, wonderful. Well, we are in, we are in, let me make sure I'm off mute. I am I think in for um, a really valuable opportunity. When I say we, I mean the students here at Miami University, many of you who I've been um, journeying with as you contemplate, like what is my purpose and what is my role? in the social transformation I want to see in the world. And those are big questions to be asking and great to be asking them while you're, while you're studying and um, within the university. And it becomes um, as important, I'd say it goes on, um, can continue to go on throughout your life as you begin to develop your professional careers and think about different opportunities. And so tonight, um, we have three people with us who have taken various paths to pursue um, mission and purpose as, as they see it, as they have discovered it throughout their career. So we have um, Katrina Burdell, uh, who is the head of social impact and community investment for Hershey Company. So when we think about corporate social responsibility and that and that work that goes on in corporations, um, Katrina, who can someone needs to go on mute? <laughs> Um, you have one too. I, I guys, if you want to go on mute, it would be helpful. That Thank you. Just so we're recording. Thank you so much. Um, so Katrina is going to bring that perspective at the Hershey Company. We have Michael Forrester, who is the director of the Office of Environment and Sustainability for the city of Cincinnati. And he will tell his story about um, how he got into that, that work. But being... Um, being inside government where there's the opportunity for public policy-based solutions to challenges that we face. And we have Kasha Huck, who is the activism manager for all of North America for The Body Shop, which is, um, which is a fantastic um, company that sells all kinds of uh, sustainable body products made all around the world. And um, Kasha will uh, share with you the work that she's doing and also her career path, how she got there. So we have um, three interesting perspectives from people who I really um, respect and appreciate you being here. So with that, um, I'm going to ask you all this question. It's starting with, I'll start with Katrina and then go through each of you. But if you could, um, Katrina, just share your story of like what brings you to the work that you're doing, sort of your journey that got you now to your position within Hershey and, and doing your work in corporate social responsibility. 
And if you can, um, maybe include what you studied in college and what res uh, what relevance that had to you and your your journey to the work that you're now doing. Awesome. Thank you so much. And I just want to say a big thank you to everyone. Um, really appreciate the chance to be with you all tonight. Um, and hopefully learn from our other wonderful panelists and, and the students too. Um, so yeah, I'm Katrina Burdell. I work at the Hershey Company. Um, and I think my path has been winding, but one thing that um, that brought me to this, this role today, but one thing that I always knew I wanted to do and wasn't sure what form it would take um, was to kind of make a difference in communities and to feel like the work that I chose to do and, and get paid for um, would somehow be personally fulfilling and fulfilling um, to make a difference in the world overall. Like we all leave college feeling that way, right? Hopefully. Um, but so I really wasn't sure what shape that would take. So my path was winding. Um, it actually intersected with Tracy, who I've had the pleasure of, of having as a professional contact and, and mentor over the years. Um, but in college, I, I've always been drawn to understanding um, what makes us different and what makes us kind of what can bridge gaps and divides in communities and among in relationships and, and just understanding different cultures and, and worldviews. So I studied um, languages in, in college. I was a Spanish major. I was also a religion, a comparative religion major. Um, so those were my, my two majors in undergrad. And I really wasn't sure what I was going to do. I was thinking maybe law school, um, doing something like human rights law or in, immigration law, some sort of public interest work. Um, but wasn't sure. So after college, I took a, a, um, a job doing legal assistant work at a law firm to see if I wanted to do it while I was studying for LSATs. Um, and where I ended up landing after about two years of doing that was realized there was a lot of unhappy lawyers at this law firm where I worked. Um, and as much as the, you know, I think it's a great passport and a wonderful career. Um, if you, if you can kind of follow your heart in law, otherwise you might end up doing things that, and being, being kind of um, pressured to, to make a lot of money and, and spend your time doing things that aren't as fulfilling. So what I ended up realizing in that process was um, actually living through a major world event that some of you, all, all of you are familiar with, but not sure all of you have lived through, honestly. But I, um, September 11th for me was extremely formative. I was two years into my working career, um, actually right around, actually about a year into my working career and realized that the incredible amount of cultural change that was happening in the aftermath of September 11th was something I felt personally called to address as someone who had kind of studied world religions and was seeing increasing fear and divides in society. Um, and I just thought that, okay, I need to make a difference here. I ended up applying to graduate schools to continue my work in um, comparative religion and ended up getting a, a scholarship to go to Emory University and get a master's there to study comparative religion. You guys are like, how did she end up at Hershey? But um, that really informed me and just the way people's worldviews shape how they interact in society. Um, and it also gave me the chance to really dig deep and just understand different cultures and, and how do we connect as people um, and be in community with one another. Um, it was a great gift to be able to study that, but I also realized through that master's degree in the humanities that I did not wanna spend another 10 years getting a PhD, which may or may not be at the end of that 10 year road, um, there may or may not be a, a tenure track faculty position waiting for me. Um, and I just wasn't ready to risk it um, and give up a decade of my life. I see lots of nodding heads. Okay, <laughs> recovering academics out there. Um, anyway, so what I did realize very quickly after I left with my master's um, was I was like, I'm gonna be in academia or I'm gonna be in nonprofits probably for the rest of my life. I better learn how to fundraise or sing for my supper, how to raise money. Um, so I jumped into nonprofit fundraising roles. I learned how to be a grant writer, um, learned how to build partnerships between nonprofits. And that was my work um, for the first part of my career after my master's. And that's where I got to meet Tracy. We worked at a, a wonderful large foundation, but really focused on building partnerships and actually raising money um, that the foundation could put towards their programs. Um, so I did that and then eventually built a lot of trust with some of my donors and um, in the fundraising roles that I had. And they began to increasingly ask me questions around, hey, I'm passionate about this issue. I've trusted you with my funding. Where should I maybe direct my dollars if I wanna you know, get involved in this issue as well? And I started informally advising them and realized there was a career in that. 
Um, and that led me to a career in a, con a consulting company in Washington, DC that did exactly that. It's called Arabella Advisors. They work with foundations and um, families as well as companies and help build their strategies for impacting change in the world, impact investments, grant making, and incubating um, startup nonprofit projects. So I got to, to work across all of those lines for about five years and then felt really increasingly my clients became, um, were companies who were asking me to think about ways they could um, give back to the community, but also use their um, brands for change. And so that's what led me eventually to the Hershey company five years ago. So in my role today, I manage all of Hershey's uh, social impact work and that is our corporate giving programs. I manage about a $20 million grant budget um, that gives back to communities across the country and around the world. I manage our employee volunteerism. So thinking about Hershey's 17,000 employees and how do we get them involved in their communities um, through volunteerism and, and activism and other ways. Um, and then how do we also use our brands and our voice as a company, um, our business operations and decision-making on where our ingredients come from, what types of um, labor practices and human capital um, policies we have, how do we do those things to really uh, make a difference in the world and kind of achieve long-term goals, not only for the company, but for society as well. Um, and I will say, we'll talk about challenges in a little bit, but it's been a massive learning experience for me to, to get that business um, expertise, which I didn't really have. So I've been a beginner all over again over the past five years, understanding how a big Fortune 500 company works. Um, but I also bring a lot of um, what I would say a lot of other perspective on how communities and how nonprofits and how partnerships work that you know your traditional MBA business folks might not have. So it's been a really fun, um, really fun few years for me to, to jump in there. So I hope that helps, but it was a winding path. Didn't know where it ended up, but I'm really happy to be here. Mm, really interesting, um, Katrina. Thank you for that. I think it does. Um, it's exciting to think you actually don't have to know precisely what your ultimate path might be and that it that it evolves over time as you build your skill set and your connections and and learn the different opportunities that are out there. So um, thank you for that, Katrina. And as we move on to Michael, I'm, I'm going to ask if um, if our students, if you're able, if you're in a place where you're able, it, it's it is nice to see your faces if you can go on video. And I understand sometimes you're in a place where you can't do that, so that's fine. But I'm just going to encourage you because it's um it's really nice for our speakers to get to see you too. So um, thank you if you're able. So Michael, um, over to you, same question. Um, if you could tell us what brought you to the work that you do now, what was your journey and, um, and including your, your time in college and how that got you to where you are today. Sure. Um, hi everyone, my name is Michael Forrester and I'm set out to save the world, um, realistically. Um, that's, you know, mo motivation in college. I came out as wanting to do an environmental something. Uh, didn't know what it was, didn't know what it was going to look like, uh, but knew that that's what I wanted to do. So took a, a winding path, but I kind of uh, charted it as, you know, you, 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 you got your left side, you got your, your right side of, of, of your paths, and you just kind of bounce in between the two sides and see where you end up. Um, so I am a um, Western College graduate, uh, went to Miami University. Uh, in fact, my uh, terrible uh, senior thesis is gathering dust, dust somewhere down in the archives down there. Um, never read it, it's awful. Um, but basically I came out and thought I was going to go to environmental law. Um, that's really where I thought I was going, but I ended up, um, finding a graduate program at Indiana University. It's called the O'Neill School, which is very public focused. Um, uh, basically it trains policy wonks. So if you ever wanna work in the federal government, US EPA, FERC, NERC, any of that sort of stuff, um, it's a great place to do it. And so got a master's degree in public administration um, and got out, went straight from Western into grad school and got out and uh, tried to find a job. And everyone said, you don't have any work experience. Um, so that was a, a little shocking and a little surprising getting fresh out of graduate school, um, but ended up getting a, a, a job at this uh, uh, COSI up in Columbus, the Center of Science and Industry, 
where I manage volunteers and help design exhibits. And so it's really cool to go up there now with my kids and see some of the exhibits that I built um, and see the kids interact with them and all that sort of stuff. Uh, actually, I got, um, they, they, they were starting this new environmental thing where they were gonna start teaching environmental education. Um, and they found out that I had the master's degree in environmental policy and, and uh, basically plopped it in my lap and said, okay, go figure it out. Um, so I did that. Uh, did a watershed laboratory out there focusing on watersheds, developed renewable energy curriculum, um, both for COSI and for, um, and for science centers across the country through that. And then uh, similar to what's happening literally right now, um, a giant stimulus package came through in 2009, um, which meant that there was a lot of opportunity. And so I shifted over to the state energy office for the state of Ohio and installed renewable energy and ran grant programs throughout the state. So we installed over $37 million worth of uh, renewable energy, giant wind turbines. If anybody's from Cleveland, the giant Lincoln Electric wind turbine that's up there is one of them. Um, we installed solar arrays throughout the country, the city of, or throughout the state, the city of Cincinnati um, has 27 solar arrays uh, in its, uh, on its public buildings, approximately half of those were funded through the RS stimulus projects. Um, and we also did um, anaerobic digesters, which is essentially uh, capturing methane emitted from waste products and, and, and running renewable generation. Um, did so well with that project that we spent all of the money and the, uh, the state said, great, thank you. Appreciate everything that you've done. Uh, we don't have any more money for you and we don't have any more work for you. Um, so I had to go out and go find um, new work, and that led me down here to the city of Cincinnati, where I'm at, where I was the energy manager, focusing on energy efficiency and renewable energy, um, and did a lot. We're currently in the process of building the largest municipal solar array in the country, 40 miles outside of the city of Cincinnati in Highland County. Um, it's 100 megawatts of power. To put that in perspective, it's approximately a thousand acres, 750 football fields. Will can power up to 25,000 homes and functionally will provide 25% uh, of city government's energy consumption um, through, through the array. So uh, big array currently under construction, hopes to go online here in December next month. Um, we're having some supply chain issues just like everybody else is, but we'll, we'll get some power flowing here really soon. Um, and then, yeah, last year I got promoted to the director of the, uh, of the office. Um, and so my role expanded to instead of just focusing on energy efficiency and renewable energy, uh, I'll, I'll also manage the, uh, the Cincinnati curbside recycling program, as well as um, environmental permitting and brownfield remediation um, across, across the city of Cincinnati. So we have a staff of about nine individuals and three additional contractors um, that focus on making implementing the green cincinnati plan which lays out 80 recommendations uh, to move cincinnati towards a more sustainable equitable and resilient community um, and now we get this infrastructure bill coming out and we get to do a lot more cool stuff um, so i'm currently jumping into that and figuring out what we're going to do um, with that opportunity around electrification around um, vehicles, around parking structures, around transportation, increasing resiliency in the city and doing it with an eye towards climate equity um, and empowering our disenfranchised communities, our BIPOC communities and our low income communities to take action over their own energy spend. So the next couple of years are gonna be a lot of fun too. So, sounds in the best way, um, you know, busy in, in, in having additional resources to keep doing this kind of work where we can have a vision for for an equitable resilient city but you know how do you make that come alive and it sounds like um that's your work michael and um and we'll hear more more about it and we'll also make space for you all to ask questions but let's keep going let's go let's turn to kasha and and hear kasha your journey to what brings you to your work and and how um you know, your college education may or may not have helped prepare you for the work you did with B Corp and also where you are now with The Body Shop. Thank you, Tracy. Um, hi, everyone. My name is Kasha. I am based um, on the ancestral territories 
um, the Huron Wendat, the Petun, the Mississaugas of the Credit Trust Nation, um, also known as Toronto. Um, really excited to join you all tonight. Um, so I studied international relations in, in undergrad. I kind of went into it not really knowing what I wanted to do. I grew up um, without a ton of sort of influence of people around me. Under, uh, you like my, my, I grew up in a village. <laughs> I, I knew what my parents did. I didn't really have a ton of um, understanding of what different careers could look like. And so I was uh, thinking I would either be a teacher or maybe go into international relations. I like the idea of diplomacy. Um, so I studied international relations and in my undergrad degree, I um, started applying for internships in international development. Um, and there were a ton that were really interesting. Many of them were not paid. And so um, that just led me to the one that I chose. Um, it was the only one that was paid and it was uh, an organization that did human security um, in Ukraine. Um, so I moved to Ukraine for the summer and it was the, uh, the, the summer that the government collapsed. So as I got there, I was working on elections and election freedom, um, which is really helpful uh, you know, timing because it meant that I had a lot of work to do. Um, and because it was an internship, I worked kind of across a few different human rights issues. So I worked on media transparency. Um, Ukraine was sort of coming out of a period where media was not free. Um, so it was sort of learning how to exist in that world, how journalism works when um, it's, it's fair coverage and things like that. Um, I worked on gender-based violence, human trafficking, but most of the focus was on um, elections. And um, because of the SNAP elections, I ended up staying there for a full year. Um, and then I came back and I started working. Um, I, I moved to do my, my graduate degree in uh, international studies too. And I took a focus on Europe, Eurasia and Eastern Europe. Um, and I focused on access to asylum rights. So I was looking at the ways that people come through Eastern Europe to access Europe and then are sent to Eastern European countries um, at, under that third party or the safe third country rule. Um, and that whole kind of like the idea of migration and policies around migration and like the idea of identity linked to geography and all of those pieces were really interesting to me. Um, but I didn't really know what to do with it. Um, I was really kind of exploring what a career in migration studies could look like. Um, and worked with my thesis uh, supervisor to sort of identify uh, internships from there. Again, picked the first one that was paid, which was lucky it was the UN in uh, Vietnam. I, I got a job in Hanoi. Um, so I moved to Hanoi for about eight months working on human trafficking and human smuggling, um, mostly doing kind of research and then support groups for victims, as well as setting up like a migrant information center and different projects that we could um, do to support migrant rights. Um, and then uh, while I was there, the office in um, Hanoi, op uh, sorry, they opened up an office in Toronto. So I actually moved from the office in Hanoi to the office in Toronto, helped them open up a pilot project um, that was supporting deportees. So helping people that were being deported um, with humanitarian assistance. So I did sort of like, um, I guess, frontline work. We were helping migrants who um, were returning to set up micro grants and help them adjust to their country of origin. And I did that for a few years um, and realized that um, helping people was really like um, something that I was passionate about, but um, I was really, it was really, um, I guess, dealing with sort of uh, individual trauma on a recurring basis is really difficult if there's not sort of a systems change component to the work. And that was what really drove me to think about how can I engage in a system that um, is, is constantly sort of putting people in these precarious situations? And rather than um, helping people on an individual basis, is there something that I could be doing um, that would actually kind of shift the way that we work? And I will say too, kind of as I was uh, working in Vietnam, I was um, doing a lot of my own reading and, and research and I was feeling quite disconnected from the international development aid model and just understanding sort of the legacies of colonialism within that. And it was something that I realized, um, you know, for me, I wanted to take a different approach and I wanted to think about how um, models of aid could, could look and act differently. And so um, that was when I stumbled upon um, this community of B Corps and um, businesses that are 
thinking about how they use their environment or sorry, their um, economic impact to actually address um, social or, envir or environmental issues. And I was really um, interested in this idea. So I sort of um, looked at the community of B Corps in Toronto and I ended up working for a B Corp um, marketing agency. So I left um, international development. I went to work with this marketing agency that focused specifically on helping clients that were for-profit or non-profit, but really focused on uh, impact work. So we worked with everyone from like Under Armour designing their um, social impact strategy to small startups that were just getting off the ground, solar panel companies and different kind of organizations that were working in this space, as well as a, a few different nonprofits. Um, and after a few years there, I just decided I wanted to get closer to that work um, around systems change. And so I started working with B-Lab, which is the nonprofit behind B Corp certification. And I was there for about four years. Um, I was leading the Canadian office. Um, B-Lab is a global nonprofit. So I was um, supporting the Canadian community, um, helping companies kind of come together for collective impact. So um, we just had COP26. Um, when we had COP25, I supported the delegation of businesses that made sort of a historic commitment for businesses to meet um, net zero goals by 2030, which was um, a, a full 20 years ahead of the Paris Agreement. Uh, commitments and other kind of business collective action work that we wanted to do. Um, and then, and then, yeah, so I wrapped up my work with B-Lab in October and I joined the Body Shop this year. I'm heading up activism um, across North America, so across the U.S. and Canada uh, specifically, and uh, our focus is really on social justice. So we've been a feminist brand since the 70s, always working on um, different pieces of social justice and environmental justice and the intersectionality between the two. Um, and the work uh, is, is really focused on, you know, how do we use our footprint as a company? We have um, hundreds of stores across the US and Canada. So how do we sort of lift up the impact that we can have in those local communities, as well as how do we as a business kind of use our, our voice um, to support good work. So um, for example, this year in the US, we are supporting the Equality Act, um, which protects the rights of um, 2S LGBTQIA plus people uh, to access civil rights protections and um, we kind of find it really important to use our business voice in conversations like that because um, in politics specifically, I think the business voice um, can have a huge impact when there is support there. Um, I'll wrap up there. Great, Kasha. Thank you. Um, and, and we'll keep diving into your, to your work as we um, move throughout this conversation. And so um, for, for our group, for our, our class and those who have joined us, um, I'm gonna ask two more questions to, to walk through um, some, some other important issues with our, our guests, but feel free to add questions in chat, but also know we're gonna open up some space for you to do um, Q&A at about 10 minutes till seven. So I want, to, I want you to know that you can ask questions too. And we'll field those um, to make sure we're, we're getting um, what what is on your mind covered as well. So let's um, let's keep going. So um, so listening to each one of you and and what moves you and drives you, whether that is um, wanting to look at what divides us and and what could bridge us, looking at um, environmental sustainability, human rights, like these these big um, important purpose driven. Um, missions that you have and the kind of world you want to see, you, you now find yourselves um, in the corporate sector, the government sector. And, um, and what, I'm, what I'd love for you to share is, is there anything about that work that you find yourself in or the sector that you're in, be it government, um, corporate, that troubles you um, in terms of wanting to pursue this kind of world that you want to see. So is there, so are there challenges or things that trouble you inside the sector you work? And how are you trying to, um, how are you trying to do your work differently? What's different about, um, about how you work inside the government and inside these um, large corporations? So again, maybe we'll go back up to you, Katrina. Sure. I mean, that's such a, I love the question. Um, I will say, you know, being at my the consulting company I was at previously was a B Corp, and so going from there to a Fortune 500 very large company um, that is not a B Corp, and there is some 
some precedence for some larger companies going through that, that process. Um, but it is interesting to see the difference and to, um, to think about, okay, we're in a capitalist society <laughs> where, you know, I work at a company where it is a publicly traded company, shareholder value, investor relations. Those, those topics are always top of mind. Um, our marketing teams, our, our senior leadership are always thinking about, are we going to meet our targets and goals for this quarter? Are we going to meet our annual earnings targets for our shareholders? There is a, um, and this is changing, and, and there is a lot of um, conversation around um, shifting this over time with, with large companies, but there is this kind of short-term thinking around, you know, one quarter, two quarters, one year, maybe two years out, when there's such an urgency um, around the environmental issues and the social issues that requires strategic sustained change. And I think that's something that for me is troubling. Um, trying to think about how do we approach these large problems, large you know, challenges and problems and shift the thinking from short-term to long-term. And so things like uh, what Kasha was talking about, you know, coalitions of, of companies that can make change that are signing on for long-term commitments. Um, Hershey has, we have our commitments through 2030. We're, you know, part of the, um, the UN uh, Global Compact and, and aligned to the, S the Sustainable Development Goals. Uh, we do a lot across different um, sectors relating to, to cocoa and, and ingredients and our supply chain um, and really are trying to think longer term, but that is not the norm. And so whenever we're, we're really trying to get an entire organization on board with a goal for 2030 or even beyond, um, that's, that's troubling <laughs> and, and tricky. Um, but that said, I, we have been responding differently by really trying to take the long view um, and balance this need to like work urgent, urgently but also balance that with sustained effort. Um, it's like, you know, make haste slowly, like run the race really hard, but know that you're gonna be in the marathon um, rather than the sprint to really impact change. Um, so that's kind of the top thing. And then I would also just say the other big piece that comes to mind is you, you know, a lot of companies um, really have to be careful about greenwashing, about making sure that the, their efforts are not, um, marketing employees. And so for me, bringing this sense of humility and authenticity and honesty on where are the, where are the places where uh, we as a company feel like we're a leader or like we've been doing this for a long time and can actually um, bring others along, bring other companies along. And where are we beginners? And can we be honest about that and not do the big marketing splash, but just do the work for a while? Um, so that's, I think, something I'm always thinking about is, is how can we really approach this in a way that um, is as holistic as possible that incorporates various perspectives that, um, that really centers the work and not the storytelling or the flashy marketing. Um, so anyway, those are, that's hopefully a little bit of the, um, the stuff that keeps me up at night. It's like, are we approaching these topics in the right way that, that really also, uh, um, recognizes the fact that they are so interconnected and interdisciplinary and, you know, our environmental commitments Im impact communities and people, um, you know, and are we elevating all the right voices from an inclusion perspective too. And Katrina, are you able to, um, I, I really appreciate that comment of like having the humility to understand where your beginners Mm -hmm. um, despite obviously a, a, a company that has been around um, and in, in many ways has been a leader, are you able to, to think of um, where you feel like you, you are at the beginning stages of something um, in this work around corporate social responsibility? Yeah, sure. I mean, I think um, we recently just set science-based targets as a company, which is a um, when we're thinking about our greenhouse gas emissions and where we want to be by 2030, and, and we just went through a process of determining kind of what is our, you know, when we think about our planetary boundaries um, related to climate change, what is our fair share of greenhouse gas reductions, for example? Um, and that was a several year process that we went through. Um, and we had to learn a lot really quickly. And um, we actually did it very quietly without a lot of fanfare. Um, and now we're, we've gone past our, you know, um, we're, we're thinking about net zero, we're thinking even beyond that and how do we get into a place that um, is past, you know, 
exceeds our science-based target when it comes to reduction. So that's one where, um, you know, we're certainly beginners and, and have so much work to do on our environmental efforts. Um, and, and water is our next big topic there that we are, I will say, complete beginners on. So you will not be seeing big flashy marketing campaigns around Hershey and, and, and water, for example, because we really want to do the learning and, and, and think about it um, and do it right before we have, have something to, to celebrate. Really interesting. Thank you, Katrina. And Michael, how about you? They are working inside um, the the government sector. Are there are there aspects that um, that you find troubling or challenging? And and how how do you see um, going about your work differently to, um, to 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 make change? Yeah. So I mean, I think. Well, let me say a couple of things. One of the things that I really like about local government is that it's about delivering services to residents. Uh, whether you're a Democrat or whether you're a Republican, um, you still want to make sure that the, that your that your city runs and you know you're delivering a service to your residents and you're you're protecting your residents' taxpayer dollars and you're being very um, vigilant about that. And so I, I I say that because I think it's incredibly important. Um, that when we talk about, you know, obstacles that, that, that I encounter, um, typically it's people coming from the, from a good place and that, you know, me, myself as an individual, um, needs to, um, either figure out how to reframe, rephrase, or reevaluate what I'm trying to push forward. Um, because, you know, I'm in, in a lot of cases, when you're talking sustainability, um, you're talking about, you know, eliminating some sort of waste. And so there can be, gen there can, you can generate income to help initiate those sustainability initiatives, but you need to bring others along within your city, within your city um, to see things the way that you do. So for example, if you're doing a large LED lighting retrofit project, um, you may, they may not provide you with any upfront money to do that but you need to train the budget office to capture the energy savings and reinvest it into that project over time. So it's a, it's a very different way of, um, of viewing things and the different way that departments um, analyze and evaluate things. And so I, one of the challenges is kind of getting people to think outside of their box, you know, getting them to, 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 to come along on the journey with you um, because a lot of my job is tetrising the money together to make things happen, gathering a little bit of energy savings here, gathering a little bit of operational savings over here, and then making the business case to push things forward. Because while we all want to do the right thing, ultimately we do need to pay for that thing. And so we need to figure out how to do that. It's very important. And so, yes, there are times when you're frustrated that you know, the budget office won't allow you to grab $400,000 in energy savings and do with what you want. Um, but that's just because uh, there's other priorities out there or potentially you know, you're, you're pitching an idea that people just aren't comfortable with. Um, the other thing that I will say that's incredibly frustrating is the fact that sustainability is political, um, just as the general nature of it, uh, you know, protecting our environment, um, advancing technologies, um, helping people, uh, looking at how climates will impact um, low-income populations, specific uh, neighborhoods of um, our, our black and brown community. Like those are things, those are questions that we should be asking um, from a policy perspective because there will be differential impacts um, going forward. And so seeing that get thrown into a political realm through a political lens, um, it, it doesn't move the conversation forward. Um, so having worked at the state level, having interacted with the feds, politics play, does play a big role in all of that. And so again, like I said, it's one of the advantages of working on a local government level in that you know everyone's trying to serve their residents. And so, um, but yeah, I mean, obviously politics I do play in a political world, so it, it can get frustrating at times. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks for sharing that perspective, Michael. And Kasha, let's let's turn to you and and 
the domain that you're working in, you know, large now um, corporation, the body shop, and, and maybe what troubles you about that space or how you're doing your work differently. But what I'd ask you to also maybe go a little bit more into, since you really know this, um, is like, what is a B Corps and how is that different? Like, what is that status? Why is it important? And how is it different? Or why would a company want that versus being not a B Corps? Like, then what are they? So let's just make sure that we're all clear on what a B Corps is too, if yeah. you can help us. Yeah, happy to. And I think it segues really well with what Michael and Katrina was saying, um, because it is about that regulatory environment that businesses operate in. So since the 70s, we've been kind of building businesses on this idea of, of uh, Friedman that businesses exist for the profit of their shareholders. And so the idea of B Corps is B Corporations, um, you know, when you register a company, it's usually a C Corp or an S Corp. So B Corp is around the idea of benefit or you know a business for good and the idea is that you would really bake that into the dna of a company by doing a review of the practices and the operations um, but also the policies of a company um, and you think about it across a kind of host of different areas so you think about your impact on the environment so if you're in manufacturing you think about things like water usage um, if you think about your community and how you donate and give back, um, or potentially how you work with different stakeholders, if you're looking to engage low-income communities, for example, what does that process look like? Um, if you are looking at your workers, it could be things like if you're a worker-owned company, or if you give your workers like really great benefits, like parental leave and you know sick leave and all of those pieces. Um, then there is the governance structure of the company, like how you actually run your company, what your transparency is around your financials, considerations like that. Um, I'm not sure if I'm missing one. Governance, environment, workers, community, and I think I think I think I'm missing one, but I can't remember which one it is. Um, workers, community environment, governance, and it'll come to me. Anyway, so it's really kind of taking the holistic view of the company and how you operate. Um, and I think what sets B Corps apart is that they're intentionally putting themselves through this process. So a lot of companies will um, do a lot of good work, but um, the, the difference with B Corp, it's a really rigorous process. So it, it actually takes a lot of investment and time to align along these the uh, aligned to these policies. But then once you've kind of reached that, it's this ongoing journey. So it's really joining a collective of businesses that are thinking critically about their business practices and constantly working to make sure that they are uh, improving those processes over time because the requirements for being a B Corp actually get more rigorous as you go as you go on as time progresses. Um, and I think the power of that is you're joining a, a community of companies that are thinking very differently about what their footprint in the world looks like. And so there's less, um, I mean, I, I would definitely say working for a B Corp, it's less of that like how do we convince people that this is a moral imperative to engage on this issue or to, um, you know, off of sick leave for employees or different things like that. It's, it's just sort of a, it can become really entrenched in the company and it can become easier to have some of those conversations because you're starting from this baseline understanding of businesses should actually positively impact their communities or their environment versus kind of having to make an argument for that. Um, I think what's challenging is, is to come back to the regulatory environment. We don't reward companies for functioning in that way. So we currently um, make it pretty difficult for companies that are wanting to do good um, in ways like subsidizing companies that are not doing so, so such good work. And so if there are um, no real benefits in terms of kind of the regulatory environment that a business operates in, um, it can be really difficult. It puts, the, it puts the burden onto the company themselves to do things for the right reasons. Um, and as Katrina mentioned, with so much greenwashing, what we end up with is some companies will try to act as though because there is this halo effect on the company to um, operate in a certain way. And if the company 
kind of doesn't do those practices, there isn't as much rigor around um, some of the claims. The UK actually just introduced kind of a Green Claims Council in their advertising, which is an interesting step. Um, but B Corp is sort of that process for companies. So it's a voluntary way to opt in to say, I'm going to hold myself to this highest end as, as a company. Um, so, I mean, I would say, yeah, the, the, one of the challenges is definitely the fact that we operate in a system that's not necessarily designed to, um, as Katrina mentioned, kind of designed for long-term uh, outcomes. It's, it's more of a short-term um, outcome-driven environmental environment that businesses operate in today. Um, and so the, and then there's the other piece of it that um, because of that whole environment, a lot of consumers uh, don't really trust that companies are doing the right thing. So you do have to spend a bit of time building trust as an organization to um, to make sure your brand is showing up in the way that you, um, you, you know, you're intentionally wanting it to show up in a way that people understand what you're doing and they understand the credibility. And sometimes it can be hard to, to you know, um, I think it can be hard to show that without having done the deep work um, and the deep work takes so long. So it's a bit of a process. And as Katrina said too, like sometimes it's you're doing the work but you're not necessarily shouting about it. So then it can be difficult to um, align internally even to get your colleagues on board because it doesn't feel like you're necessarily um, able to shout out about this progress even though it's you know taking a lot of effort and a lot of work. So that's definitely um, one of the challenges. And and practically speaking, is there a place that students can go to look for like which companies are B Corps as they're looking for places to work? Yeah, I would totally recommend that. So um, bcorporation.net has a whole directory of companies and I believe they have a job board on their website that you can look through for companies that are actively hiring. Um, there are thousands across the world. So um, definitely options to choose from. Great, helpful. Um, one more question and I'm gonna open it up. So have your, be thinking of questions and know that you are, um, your questions are welcome. So um, Katrina and then Michael and Kasha, could you um, just describe experiences or skill sets or mindsets that you think are helpful for, um, for young professionals to develop and bring um, to, to their work? Like as, as our students are thinking about their next steps and moving into their first jobs and building a career path, um, what do you think are helpful skill sets and mindsets in this type of work? And Katrina, I'll start sure. with you. Yeah, thank you. And one other, just before I answer that one, I did want to also say, in addition to the awesome directory for B Corps um, companies, if you are in a position where you're interviewing with a company, you should check out their website and see if they publish a sustainability report, um, regardless of you know whether they're classified as a B Corp or not, because you can learn a lot about what their commitments are and what their progress is. Um, and they usually publish those on an annual basis. Um, so yeah, as far as experiences, skill sets, mindsets, um, a couple of big ones came to mind for me. One is really, I think, and this is a probably a newer one for, for our practitioners, but it's something you've, you've heard in conversation and have probably reflected on as a part of this course is um, be aware or at least have, have reflected on your privilege um, that you may have, as well as kind of the power that you hold. Um, so, you know, we all have this tendency to kind of center ourselves or, or you know, our particular experience um, in the work. And there's a little bit of kind of unlearning that we can all do before we can really serve, I think, in, in the ways that, that we all want to. So just, just having that in mind um, and knowing that you bring a really unique perspective, but that's also a lens um, on approaching issues. So I wanted to just flag that because that's something I've really been been working through and have found it to be to be beneficial with the, the more and more kind of communities and and spaces that I, that I have the chance to to be a part of. Um, the other big one is, and this has served me well, and I, I can't imagine a situation when it wouldn't serve someone well. Is and this is exactly what college hopefully prepares you to do, is become a great generalist. Like we're all going to be, you know, over the course of our careers and graduate studies and opportunities you're given, you will become a specialist um, with technical knowledge on a specific topic. 
but it not every not everyone can become a great generalist like if you can get up to speed on an issue quickly and know exactly your steps to do that, no matter what the issue or topic is, because these issues in, in sustainability and social impact are so interconnected, um, if you can like know how to ask good questions, know how to listen to stakeholders, know how to um, you know see issues holistically from the like high level, as well as how to do desk research and how to figure out, okay, who are three experts I'm gonna call and just interview to get up to speed fast. Like I do this all the time in my job still um, because I can't possibly be an expert on all of these topics, but I can know exactly how I would approach it and then um, learn from others. So that's just, the, I think an amazing skill that anyone in this in this field can, uh, can, can hone over time, but you'll become a specialist and a technical <laughs> expert. But if you have your like your blueprint for how to be a great generalist and actually love it, um, it'll serve you well. Thank you. Thank you. Michael, what about you? So I just was going to say that, as I said in the comments, the generalist idea, you, you hit the you hit the nail on the head there. Um, I was, you know, curiosity, uh, ability to, to pitch ideas, uh, you know, all of that sort of stuff. But yeah, you summed it up exactly right there. You need to be the ability, uh, at least in the sustainability field, because it's constantly changing. So the ability to quickly grab and process information and develop a path forward. Um, a perfect example is, you know, four years ago, the mayor called me into his office and said, you know, hey, can we run our water department on solar? Well, yeah, sure. <laughs> I mean, we can, I think I know how to do it, um, but, and then it takes you down the rabbit hole. Um, and so you need to be able to respond to that question uh, when someone says, hey, I heard about this. Can we do it? Uh, maybe. Um, so yeah, the generalist quote is a great, is, is, is a great, great point. Um, I would also say you have to have the, the, the confidence to fail. Um, it is a big one because you will not succeed all of the time. Um, it, I, the quote that I like to tell myself is that it's not my job to tell me no. It's other people's jobs to tell me no. And that when I get to that point where that no does occur, that you know either I can uh, uh, evaluate why that no occurred, or I can uh, you know drop it and move on to some, some pick yourself up, brush yourself off and, and, and keep on moving. Um, Cause you absolutely will encounter those points in your career. Um, I guess the last thing that I would say is that, you know, if there are areas that you are starting to, you know, you want to explore more, please go do it. Um, get out there, get your hands dirty, um, call up somebody and, and have a coffee with them. Um, you know, it, whatever that might be. Um, one of the things that, you know, I certainly look for, you know, both in interns and AmeriCorps and staff is what have they done? How have they, how are they living their passions? Um, how are they, you know, what, what are they doing that shows me that they care? Um, and so that's certainly something that, that I, I always look for. Um, a, a degree is great. A study is great. Um, but, you know, have you been to your local farmer's market? If I ask you, what are you doing for sustainability in your own life? And your answer is, well, I recycle. I need a little bit more than that. Um, and so, you know, whatever that might be, um, go, go get your hands dirty. Thank you. Thank you, Michael. Maybe because we can so relate to you because you're, you're, you're a Miami University alum and, and indeed um, with the Western Program for Individualized Studies, could, could you um, even share a bit more how that was helpful for you, this, this study that you did at West, at the Western program for any, anyone listening who might be contemplating it. Why, why did that, um, why did you find that helpful? For well, your... for what, what Western does is it really allows you to get into any class anywhere for any reason. Um, at least when I went there, uh, you know, there was the barriers to entry, you know, the talking to the professors and saying, Hey, I need this class. Um, no, I haven't taken the prereqs and no, I'm not going to take the prereqs. I need this class because this is the specific to topic that I'm interested in and having that knowledge across the university that that is kind of what the Western program does um, is very, very helpful. 
you know, so as a freshman, you can go into a 400 level course, no problem. Um, I found that to be incredibly helpful because it allowed me to kind of for, forgive the language, but to cut the crap. Um, you know, I got to go to the got to go to the professors that I wanted to. I got to go to the classes that I wanted to. And yeah, I had to meet some of the Miami core requirements, um, but it, it got me out of a lot of the, the prereqs and stuff that I had to do. Um, so I found that incredibly helpful um, and it allowed me to really kind of design, you know, what I wanted to do, which at the time was, you know, environmental law focused. So I could take, you know, this class or this, this law class, this geography class, this environmental science class and really cobble something together that put me in a position to, you know, at least have a base of knowledge um, that allowed me to take where my next step was. Thank you, thank you. And Kasha, are there are there skill sets, mindsets that you think um, are particularly helpful as as students are coming into the professional world and, and pursuing careers? Yeah, I would definitely plus one um, everything that the other folks have said, but I would say. Um, one thing that I found really important is thinking about who you're going to be working with. So I think it's as important to think about what kind of work you want to be doing as who you want to be learning from. Um, so when you're going through an interview process, for example, I think it's you know important to push yourself to ask questions about the person's leadership style, what kind of skills you'll learn from them, um, especially as you're going into sort of like your first jobs post college, it can be um, really instrumental to kind of building the right networks. Um, but more so just building the right skill set. And um, with a good leader, you could potentially be doing work that's, I don't know, maybe less interesting, but way more engaging because you are so um, inspired by the way that they lead. And so I think that's a really important piece of, of looking for work. Um, I think to lift up the, um, the, the kind of conversation around privilege, I think um, considering kind of the fact that other people will generally like take up space and ask for things that they want, like know that others are doing that. And so also examine like your own lack of privilege if you have that and push yourself to kind of step up and ask for things that you want. Um, because I will say like other people are doing it. And so if you're not kind of asking for what you want yourself, um, other people will be doing it and, and taking up that space. So I, I meet with a lot of students and uh, people that are kind of exploring different careers. And, um, you know, there are definitely people that feel really um, sort of like they come in with a ton of expectations and ask for things. And then there are people that um, don't. And I think it's, you know, such a shame when you see people that are really talented and, and really know what they want, but they're a bit too afraid to ask. So I would just encourage you to do that. And on that, I would say, um, also be really prepared when you're doing that. So showing initiative, um, you know, talking about, yeah, if, if you're trying to work in environmental studies and you've, you're, your biggest thing is that you've learned how to use a recycling box, maybe it's not the best fit for you if you're not doing a bit of that work up front to really show um, how you are committed to, uh, to, to something. So um, I think a great framework to keep in mind is like, what's something I could do today? Um, that was a question that really helped me go from working in international development to working in a marketing agency as a project manager. It was, you know, what's a first step that I could take? Um, and so thinking through that, thinking through how you can um, really prepare yourself for some of those conversations or if you're making an ask and what you're showing up with and what you've done to show that you um, kind of deserve to be there. And I think that some of that is storytelling and some of that is like learning how to connect the dots for yourself. But a lot of it is just thinking about like, what's something I can do today? What's a place that I can start with and just kind of getting started from there. Really helpful. Thank you. Thanks so much, Kasha. Um, so, so our, our, the rest of our group, this is your, your time. We have, um, we have an abundant 15 minutes. That's a lot of time with three people who have come here specifically to, um, to, to help you see the possibilities for yourself, right? What are the different ways you could move forward with purpose? So Sasha, I see you have a question. How about come off mute and, and you ask directly if you can. Uh, hi, my name is Sasha. My question is, why, why do you think sustainability is so political and what can we do to change that? Thank you. Um, 
I know, I know all three of you could answer that in some ways. Michael, you're right in the work of it at the, at the city level, but also Kasha and, and Katrina, um, there's the political inside the companies too that, uh, so who would like to respond? I'm happy to, to start. Um, I think it's a great question, Sasha. I think it can be really overwhelming when you look at the um, complex kind of nature of uh, something like climate change. Um, there are so many different ways that we can address it from being proactive um, to kind of offsetting. And so it can be sort of overwhelming to take that first step. Um, I think realistically, there's also just a ton of money in not doing anything or kind of keeping the status quo, which makes it quite challenging to uh, adapt. I know um, in the US uh, with the infrastructure bill coming through, there was a lot of questions about like vested interests and who benefits from different climate policies. Um, and so I think that because of the nature of um, kind of capitalism and the environment and development being so intertwined, it can be really difficult to pull those apart and make it something that's not political. Um, but I think there's also room for conversation around um, what it means for something to be sort of, I, I guess, to think about, like, even if something is political, how do we approach a conversation in a way that feels open and kind of curious versus coming into it um, with that sense of like, it's gonna be polarized. And so I think that's um, maybe somewhere where I'm seeing hope is that in having these nuanced conversations, it's not necessarily a zero sum game where you're thinking about, you know, the person who wins this political conversation versus the person that loses, but actually how can we approach that conversation with more nuance? Thank you. Michael, Katrina, would you like to build on that or add something different? I'll go ahead and jump in. Um, I mean, it's 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 sustainability is polit political because you're asking people to do things differently. And for some people, that's they, they react fearfully. Um, for some people, they are concerned about the, the economic impact. Um, you know, it, 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 you're asking people to change. And so, you know, you're going to have people that embrace that change and you're going to have people that do not embrace that change. And so that's, you know, really how I see kind of all of that coming down, aside from the people are making money off of it, you know, the, our, our, and from a, a big picture perspective, I mean, our and a climate change perspective, you know, our country is not built to be a zero emitting country by 2050. It is not built that way. Um, a whole bunch of stuff needs to get done in order to shift to a net zero country by 2050. And it's, it's daunting. Climate change is daunting. You know, it's much easier and it doesn't necessarily directly connect to people's lives. And so there's, there's a, a disconnect there um, between actions that we take now and the results that will occur in, you know, 10 years, 20 years, you know, 50 years. What we're going to see this conversation with the infrastructure bill coming up as well, where we have all of these funds, um, but you're not going to, you know, the Brent, the Brent Spence Bridge is not going to get built for another 15 years. You know, we're not going to run a car over that bridge for 15 years. And that's just the nature of the beast. So when you talk about sustainability, it's, you know, immediate investments for long term gains. And it's, it's really hard for people to wrap their heads around that. Thank you. And um, let's see, let's see. I know Katrina, you could probably add to that, but let's see if there's other questions out there. Um, Viviana, it looks like you have a question. Viv, come on and ask, please. Hi. Um, yeah, so I don't know, maybe Katrina will will be able to tell us more about also Michael and Kasha if you if you can, but you, Katrina, you said that you work in nonprofit, but now you're working more like in companies. Uh, what would would there be like the main differences for you from working for nonprofits and a B Corp, for example? Like, what would you think it's it's what differentiates that more? Yeah, I mean, I think working so certainly the difference between um, working, you know, nonprofits are set up for social benefits and for, you know, a charitable purpose, whether that's education or, or community, um, you know, to advance some sort of charitable initiative. And I think that that is certainly at the center for why 
how they're governed, making sure that they are actually proving to the IRS what their, their benefit is every year to keep them tax exempt. Um, and certainly companies, I think B Corps are interesting because they are kind of in that space in between. Um, you know, companies of course exist to, you know, create profit or, you know, solve some sort of, um, some sort of need in the marketplace, you know, whether it's selling whatever the product may be. And I think um, the B Corp is really, you know, Kasha, you can speak to this much more, but really it is unique because in addition to um, wanting to do, you know, have business, create business value, um, wanting to sell products, wanting to, um, to work, you know, to be a competitor in the marketplace, you also are holding yourself accountable to having some sort of social environmental um, outcomes as well. And so that I think the B Corp is a really nice kind of in, in between space between traditional, you know, your traditional corporations and, and business world. Um, but from a, from a, I would say cultural perspective, it is just interesting, you know, that's kind of the, the def definitions, but um, from a cultural perspective, you are going to find, you know, nonprofits that work in an extremely business-like manner that think about client service, that have amazing strategies and business, true business plans to deliver their services to, to, um, to folks in need and, or, you know, whoever their clients may be or to whatever um, social issue they're trying to solve. So you will find, I think the, the best nonprofits will pull good learnings from business. And, and, you know, I think B Corp is one example and, and companies who really do kind of walk the walk when it comes to living out their purpose, in addition to just creating shareholder value, they draw good. I think um, the best ones that do that well, probably draw learnings from the, I would say the nonprofit sector as well. Um, we don't see as much of that, but certainly um, it certainly can hopefully influence one another. But Kasha, Michael, please jump in there. Or maybe to build on it in this way too, because this field of corporate social responsibility um, I'm saying it's new. I don't know that it's new, but it certainly is more um, on the forefront as a potential career path that um, that the students who we have right here at this really opportune time where it's it's beginning to um, grow more, take take more of a um, front and center position within companies. So how how would one go about exploring um, CSR work? And this is Caroline coming from you. So Caroline, thank you for the question. But um, Kasha, do you wanna start um, with that? Yeah, happy to. Um, I would say it, it, you know, it really depends on what piece of it you're interested in exploring. Um, if you, uh, I guess like if you have a network on LinkedIn, like one tactical way that you could do that is just find someone who's in a position that you find interesting and, and speak to them, ask them for a coffee or a Zoom, uh, chat and just see if you can um, talk to them about the way that they, you know, the, the way that their day goes, what kind of work they're doing. Um, I think if you want to um, go into sort of uh, like there are a few different options, you could work for a nonprofit, you could work for a think tank, you could work for a for profit that's doing um, this work. So from the nonprofit side, um, supporting sort of like, you know, my role at B-Lab was really supporting businesses that are thinking about this work. Um, but then also, if you want to work directly in corporate social responsibility as a lead within a for-profit, um, I think the skill sets that you would need to bring to the table are things like project management, partnership building with different community stakeholders, um, communications and marketing skills. Um, so you could think about sort of the skill sets really specifically, or you could think about uh, the industry that you want to be in. But I think there's uh, because, as you said, Tracy, it's not necessarily a new field, but it's still an emerging field, and it's pivoting in, in, in so many different ways in the last few years in particular, that I think you could um, approach it in a really creative way. Like, I've, I've seen people that have really focused on this from the get-go, landing these positions, as well as people who have, like, really come out of um, a different field and just transitioned into it because they have, you know, deep experience on the subject matter or something like that. Yeah, I, I would say there's also, um, that's completely right. You see folks who kind of have come in through a winding paths. You also increasingly do see folks who um, are getting their degrees, their, their graduate degrees. They may be getting an MBA, but with a particular focus on corporate sustainability topics or sustainability and social impact. 
And there are programs out there that train you to do that. Um, the field is evolving quickly and it is in becoming increasingly technical with regard to the, um, there's a lot of like disclosures and transparency, um, sustainability reporting. There's a zillion different like indices that you need to kind of share your information on. So there is there is a whole technical side as well as kind of the, the partnerships and the marketing and the, the philanthropy side as well. So just wanted to, um, to share that there, there are various avenues in and, and you can approach it through the business side or through kind of the, um, the impact side. Great, and uh, I'm gonna note Kara has a specific question. If Katrina and Kasha, you're able to, to look, we won't, I don't think have time to answer it, but, um, but maybe look up there in terms of your uh, work surrounding biodiversity conservation. Um, and, and for our, in our closing five minutes, um, if we could go around, we'll start with Michael, but um, just, just to have a, a minute or two, a nugget of wisdom, a minute really from each one of you, like what nugget of wisdom would you like to offer the students thinking back when you were, when you were at their time um, in their college careers, thinking about where they wanna start making their next steps into the professional world, what nugget of wisdom would you, would you like to offer them or could you offer them, Michael? Uh, <laughs> I mean, the, 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 the most basic, it, this is going to sound really, uh, I guess, trite, but go get your hands dirty um, and uh, don't be afraid to walk away from something if you don't like it. Like we are, we're all in long careers. Um, you're going to be doing this for a long time. The way that you find out what you want to do is by bouncing from job to job to job, especially, especially in the beginning. Um, you know, that's, that's okay. Uh, you know, that so many, I've seen it from so many people, experienced it myself, you know, when you, when you get your first job, you feel like, well, that's what you do now. And that's absolutely not what you do. <laughs> so don't be afraid to get out there. Don't be afraid to try new things. Don't be afraid to put in an application. If you don't meet entirely meet the qualifications, put it in anyways. You know, again, like I said earlier, it's not your job to say no, it's other people's job to do that. Um, and so that's, I mean, that's basically what I got. Thank you. Kasha, how about you? A nugget of wisdom. Um, yeah, I would say for me, what's been really helpful is kind of consistency. And so thinking through, like, I think that can be a lot of pressure if you're thinking about the end game and like what you're going towards and what this job is leading to and all of those pieces. And I think, for me, what's given me a bit of a rest in that approach is just saying, okay, what are the three to five things that this job will give me in the next year? And what are the skill sets that I can really hone in on? And so even if you're working in something that's not super aligned, um, you can think about like, oh, well, maybe I'm still getting research skills or writing skills or developing some component of this. And I think that can be helpful in sort of being reflective of your own narrative and what kind of brand you're building. Because as much as I, I hate to, you know, use the word branding around personal kind of career development, there is a component of our lives that are social right now. And, you know, you live on LinkedIn and all of these different ways, whether you like it or not. Um, and so thinking more deliberately about like what that story is and then thinking about how you can use where you're currently at to lift up some of that. I think there is a move now towards more leniency of, of not necessarily only taking education, um, but also alongside of that lived experience and different experiences that you might bring to the table. So I think just being creative about what those pieces look like and then being consistent about um, it being intentional and growing them. Thank you. And Katrina, a final tip, nugget of wisdom yeah. that you think would be helpful. Sure, I would say, I mean, there's, whatever first job you end up with there, don't overthink it. Like there will be great learning <laughs> and teachable moments and opportunities to really figure out what you, you know, what you like and dislike that will help you along the way. So there's no bad, I would say there's no bad experience out there, um, but know when it's time to go. <laughs> um, just as, as Michael was saying. And then lastly, I will say, you know, build a network and nurture it. This is something that you know, I've done, but also have neglected at times in my career, um, just think people get busy, but, um, you know, haven't, you will need trusted mentors at different moments. You'll need guides. Um, you'll just need people to, you know, 
practitioners that you can just chat with and bounce ideas off of. And, and even if you're shifting sectors, um, don't lose touch. So it is important to nurture that network because uh, you never know. Um, you never know. Oh, so helpful. And thank you so much, uh, Katrina, Kasha, and Michael for um, spending some time with us this evening, but also for the students who showed up in the evening. I know many of you came to class today and are on again tonight. I know we have some others who have joined us. I think it just shows your, your curiosity, your desire to have purpose, um, to find your purpose, to find a path, hopefully not feel so much pressure to, to know the exact path forward. And I hope you also know that you can come to us. So reach out to me, reach out to Jackie, to Boo to Billy, we can make connections to, to the speakers tonight. Um, our hope for you is that you feel like you have support um, as you move forward and figuring out that elegant next step that you're gonna take when you leave Miami University. And we're excited to see where you take it. And we need you to go and experiment, um, push us, um, come up with new ways of running companies, uh, be the kinds of leaders that will shift the cultures inside governments and companies and communities that um, will really benefit us all. So thank you for being with us tonight, everyone. And um, we look forward to additional conversations like this. Thank you. We are officially at our close. Thank you. Thank, thank you. Thank you all. Thank mm -hmm. you.